Hi, reader. I'm Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On the show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases, and I give you a peek behind the curtain of the publishing industry with my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you're looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group, which is filled with a wonderful bunch of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Do you love to be in the know about upcoming books? Kelly Hooker of At Kelly Hook Reads Books and I do too. We couldn't find a comprehensive list of titles all in one place, so we made one ourselves, and now we're sharing it with you. Our literary lookbook is a list of 182 books releasing from January to May 2024, curated for our communities. The link to buy it is in my show notes. Today, I am chatting with Mackenzie Funk about The Hanks Show. I loved the pitch for this one. The most important person you have never heard of. The Hanks Show both fascinated and horrified me regarding how our personal information is disseminated and used today. Mackenzie is a reporter at ProPublica, a National Magazine Award finalist and former McDowell, Open Society, and Logan Fiction Fellow. Mackenzie was a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan, where he studied economics and systems thinking. He speaks five languages and is a native of the Pacific Northwest, where he lives with his wife and sons. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists, it is tested for 950 contaminants, and is NSF certified for sport, it is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Mackenzie. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad you're here because I thought your book was part fascinating, part horrifying, and I have so many questions for you. Well, thanks. You received a fantastic New York Times review. I really enjoyed reading that, and I thought she hit all the notes on it. Yeah, I was impressed with the space they gave, grateful for it, and that she said that Hank Asher, the character that's done in the book, should be added to the Mount Rushmore of the Fathers of Surveillance, not a concept I would have come up with. I liked that as well. I thought it was pretty funny to envision the four of them up there on Mount Rushmore. Why don't you give me a quick synopsis of The Hank Show before we dive into my questions? Sure. It's a book about two things, really. One of those things is a person, Hank Asher, who is the so-called father of data fusion. But before that, he was a high school dropout and then a house painter and a condo painter in Florida, where he made his first fortune. Then he was a cocaine smuggler. And then he was a computer guy, and he was a computer guy who started pulling our data together and putting it in databases. And the, the second thing in the book is is a, a sort of story of that data, how it came to be put together, how it's used, who it's used on, and how this whole world's been built by someone we never heard of. How did you first learn about Hank Asher? It's a bit of a complicated story, but it was a magazine editor came to me with an idea that was mostly unrelated. And I was just doing some background research on that story, which I ended up not taking. And it mentioned that they used this software built by this guy named Hank Asher. And I, I'd never heard of him. And I sort of did some Googling, more or less. And then I saw that he just died. And then I went from there to reading the uh, things that people wrote for him on, the, on his obituary page. Basically, he had something on legacy.com and another one on his company's webpage. And what people wrote about him was just not of course, everybody says nice things about somebody when they're dead, but these weren't just nice things. They were they were weird things. They were stories about a, a real character, someone who swore all the time and 
called people in the middle of the night and paid for people's cancer treatment in college. And then there were intimations that he'd done great things for the, the war on terror. And I was confused, again, that I'd never heard of this person. And then I went in to look at to see what he actually built and then where it was today, and I became intrigued. Well, I love the tagline for the book from a blurb that is on the front cover, the most important person you've never heard of. And I feel like that totally encapsulates his life and your story. Yeah, I was. I wish I'd been able to think of such a pithy phrase myself, but I'm glad it's there. Having never heard of this person, immediately wondering why I hadn't. And the more I understood his impact on all of our lives today, the more I, I thought he should be known. And he died in 2012, right? So you've been working on this for a little while. Yeah, I've been working on this. I think I first knew about him in 2015. That's when I that's when I first read his name and and did more. I've I've been poking at the story, poking around since then, but I wasn't actively working on it until 2018. And then I took a big gap, a, a bit of a break during the pandemic because my wife is a nurse. Well, you must have done a ton of research. What all did you do? Well, in the in the early days, I spent a lot of time trying to get to the bottom of what he was doing in his early days as a cocaine smuggler, because that the fact that he had this criminal history ended up affecting so much of the rest of his life. And there were so many rumors swirling about what exactly that was that I set out, perhaps obsessively, to understand that part of his story. And that included me working with a couple researchers in Florida and doing a deep dive through public records and court records and interviews to, to get a sense of the shape of his life back then. I had to go to the Bahamas, unfortunately for me. Uh, you and, had to. Yeah. And I, I went and I tried to meet people he knew during his smuggling days and right thereafter and, and just see the terrain there and understand what he was up against. Yeah. And so I, I spent a lot of time talking to people who knew Asher when they themselves were smugglers or adjacent to that world and to former DEA agents. And that, for a lot of the early days, that's what I wanted to nail down. It's not a big part of the book. But I wanted to make sure that I that the rumors were true and that I understood what he was like then and if that would shed any light on on what he became and what he built. And then after that, you dove into everything that he did build. Yeah. Well, it helps that he was he was really litigious and those around him were. And so there were ma there were reams and reams of court records about his cases. Everything from the big breakthrough was I I went and uh, talked to F. Lee Bailey the attorney, the, the O.J. Simpson attorney eventually, but this was when he knew Asher in the Bahamas and they became friends. This was before Simpson. But F. Lee Bailey had a big part in helping Asher get out of his trouble with the, the DEA and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And so he was one of my first stops in terms of uh, interviewers who knew Asher both as a smuggler and then both a, and as a programmer. And he directed me to some court cases. He said, there's one in Chicago. Go there. You'll find that Asher testified under a fake name. And so I flew to the the archives in Chicago, had a long layover and drove to this building and just spent hours scanning these documents and, and seeing his testimony. And so he was he was involved in these cases. Then later he would he would have a lot of cases where they were intellectual property or non-compete cases where he'd be suing someone or someone would be suing him and you could get a sense of the business then. And then, yes, then I did delve into to what he built, talking to former employees, uh, former business partners, those uh, early programmers who taught him how to use a computer, and then others who taught him how to get data from the, the Florida, basically Florida's DMV, its Department of Highway Safety. And I talked to uh, his lawyers, his girlfriends, and and his daughters. His daughters were were wonderful people who who I think had a pretty clear-eyed view of who their dad was. And he was a, both a wonderful father and a very absentee one. And he was larger than life. And they, they sort of grew up in this, uh, in this world that he created. And, uh, and they were very, uh, was very, yeah, they were very clear-eyed about that. And I think really uh, wonderful people to talk to. Was it difficult to distill down all of this information that you found into a compelling but not overly complex and long tale? <laughs> yeah. It was. And and I think there was something particular to both the complexity of what he built and the complexity of him as a person. And early on, one of his right-hand men and women, a drug investigator named Bill Shrewsbury, 
who who later went to work for Asher, he he said he was the most complex man I ever knew. You know how some people have two sides. He had like eight sides. People either loved him or they hated him. They saw that he was the best person some people knew and he was the worst to others. He was explosive. He was angry, but he was also very giving. And trying to understand someone like that who was so hot and cold and who people had such varied views of and varied experiences with was difficult. And it was difficult to, I think, bring him to life. And that was that was half the challenge. And then the other challenge is that the topic of the book is is data. It's our creeping loss of privacy. And that is boring for the most <laughs> part. You know, we, it's, uh, you know, frankly, it's like I, my previous book was about climate change. And, and there's something really similar about the two, which is that as a, Americans and, and people across the world, in both cases, we know they're important. We say we, we care about privacy. We say we care about climate change. But for the most part, we don't, our, our eyes glaze over when we start talking about it. And we don't really understand what's going to happen. And we don't care enough to put it at the top of our political considerations. And so it's always this, this thing in the background. This complex thing, and it's it's very complexity makes it that we don't want to dive in, and so yeah, it was a it was difficult to try to get through all the company names and through all the technologies. But at the end of the day, it's not that hard to understand, which is that a very few companies, many of them headed or started by Hank Asher, went out and got every possible bit of information about you and everyone else in the country, and then put it together in this dossier, and that that dossier follows you now around everywhere you go that it's 30 that's this stack of information 30 years old and that's that that's fundamentally not, not that hard to understand or how how investigators would use this it's an accelerated version of how they they used to do investigations as a, as police in Florida someone tell me get tidbits and put them together until you saw the full story I do think you're right about both data collection and climate change that they're so complex that it almost just paralyzes us sometimes you you really do drill down and put it on the page in a way that we can understand that it isn't overly complex. But I, I think you're right. Sometimes people just don't know what to do. So they just sort of panic and do nothing. Yeah. And I think the the second thing is that we all think we understand privacy. And we all, I can't tell me how many times when I was reporting this book, I said, well, it's, a, it's, about, it's about a data broker, a data miner. And they'd say, ah, oh, yeah, Facebook. And I would say, no, no, actually, it's not Facebook. It's not about online data at all. It, I mean, it is. But that's that comes later. This is before the, the information that Asher and his his uh, people of his era collected came from all these disparate sources, mail order catalogs, DMVs, local governments. And this isn't about Silicon Valley. And in fact, it's about as far from Silicon Valley as you could get geographically and, and sometimes culturally. These guys were going around hoovering up information from yeah, from eventually credit card companies and, uh, and credit agencies and UPS, Blockbuster, you name it, all these old world businesses, that's, that's the world of data they lived in. And this kind of information that Asher got is really different than what we think about privacy when we're thinking online. And that's, uh, that was actually one of the difficulties was just people either thinking it's too complex or thinking they know all about this because they know about the Cambridge Analytica scandal or, or Google or Facebook hoovering up their data. Well, you lead me right into my next question, because this is the part that I thought was the most fascinating, was that it began long before any of us realized that, or maybe some of us realize it, but many do not. So can you kind of walk us through that, like how he began in Florida, the data that he compiled, how he showed people what he was doing and talked them into purchasing his software, how he learned about compiling it all together? All of that is completely and utterly unbelievable, I think, in a day of Google, and you think, oh, I just type right into the computer and I see all this stuff, or I can look myself up. But this was long before that. Yeah, and it's long enough before this moment that it, even for me, someone who who straddles the the moment where internet became widely available and and where Google became easy to use, there was of course this moment in time where you couldn't just look someone up and see all this information about them. Nobody could, and and so he in Florida which has very open public records laws, had an opportunity to kind of build the first, one of the first and best people lookup tools. And and this wasn't something on the internet because the, the web didn't really exist. But so the first step for Asher was with a partner, he figured out that if you strung together a bunch of small computers, you could effectively have a big supercomputer. And he was in Florida in the mid 80s. 
And this was at the dawn of the PC era. And there were all these personal computer parts, these processors sitting around in various shops. And you could take a bunch of these and put them together. And it's sort of like the modern cloud. It's like a server room. But the concept was totally foreign. So first they figured out, okay, we can use consumer computer parts to build a supercomputer. The next thing they realized they could do was take these public records from Florida and eventually from many other states. But Florida is important because it has such an open government, the Sunshine State, and all these laws that allow people to gather the data. And they just sucked up all the information by going to these bureaus, going to the Department of Highway Safety and saying, hi, I would like every driver's license, please. Or I would like every vehicle registration. And the state, because of the ways the law, the way the laws were written, would have to give them to them. They eventually got marriage licenses, gun licenses, fishing licenses, pilot licenses, uh, boat registrations, I think divorce records. They got business records. I believe they got voter registrations, all from Florida. They then went to credit agencies like TransUnion and uh, Equifax and Experian and got what are known as credit headers. And that's the stuff that's at the, the top of your credit report, your name and address. The idea being that that you always update your bank or your, your credit card before you tell anyone else that you've moved because you want to be able to access your money. And so they, they eventually got that from the credit bureaus and they got other data from commercial brokers. And only once they had this mountain of data, did internet data, email addresses first, and become widely available. And then they started tapping into that and sort of adding it to their their pile. But it was this was a, a decade-long process of basically finding every data set you could get, most of them held by local governments, and piling them on top of each other. And then what were they wanting to use it for originally? So the first idea that Asher's partner, John Leggett, had was that they would be able to sell this to insurance companies, specifically automotive insurance, because because of the nature of a, a Florida law that if you if you could prove that you lived with someone who had a or if an insurer could prove that that someone was in an accident and that that they lived with someone who had a different insurance company, both insurance companies would be on the hook for the damages. So all state could could share the money with State Farm and, and share the fees. So that it was a valuable tool. And the way they the way they they saw that they could get to who lived with whom was through vehicle registrations. They said, well, if we buy every vehicle registration from the Department of Highway Safety and just stack them on top of each other, we will see who shares an address. And these registrations were really cheap because it's really just the make, model, name of the owner, and then where they live. But when two people live in the same place, and when two people live in the same place multiple times, that tells you something about their relationship. And so that was the the first view, was just insurance companies. But Asher, because of his past as a smuggler, because he'd worked with the DEA as an informant, he also knew how much law enforcement would be excited by this information. So he very quickly went to local police and said, hey, if I could give you this searchable database of vehicle registrations and other public records, would that be of interest to you? And boy, was it. I can tell you about the demonstrations they would do if that's in. I was just going to ask you because I know there's one in particular that's pretty funny. So yes, I would love that. So yeah, in, in the early days, they would go to these trade shows all of the sheriffs in Florida or all of the police chiefs, and they would set up a booth with their computer and a big screen and just ask people if they wanted to run their own names. And inevitably, these chiefs would walk over and say, sure, yeah, run me. I don't think you'll find anything. And <laughs> in fact, their eyes would just go wide as unlisted phone numbers came up and a whole history of addresses came up and all their licenses came up and all their cars came up and got bigger and bigger. And there were stories about there was one case where a chief came up and said, run me. And then they saw that his wife had been married before. And he said, no, 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 that's not true. And there she was standing with him and she got red in the face. And he said, no, she she was never married before. And then she sort of nodded and said, actually, I was. And then they walked off in a huff. <laughs> they were like busted. She's like, no, 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 don't run anybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other thing that I think was related to this at this point in time was that he was able to determine who undercover agents were because the way the DEA had listed all their cars. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And I thought, oh my gosh, like they were just uncovering all of this data that you would not think would lead to the things that it did. I, I found it completely intriguing. I just kept wanting to learn more. Yeah. I think at the time, it was really early for, for us to understand that if you put a bunch of information together, well, you'll you'll see patterns in it. 
and and of course that's the promise of of big data big data is is that right but back then nobody thought about oh yeah let's just let's just register all the DEA agents undercover cars here at the same address because nobody will know but if somebody builds a computer that can look at all of that all at once then then absolutely they will know now there was another thing that he did which was he really wanted to get crash data he wanted to find out who was in an accident with whom because just like living just like a shared address history shows you the nature of someone's relationship if you can see that that someone was the passenger in a car wreck you know that they know the driver pretty well and you can show the strength of their relationship and what he was really doing is what mark zuckerberg and everybody else wanted to do later which was build this graph of relationships this sort of network of who knows who in america and where do they go what do they have and just it's like these spider charts you see from the from the thrillers on TV, these link charts where you you see who are the who are the nodes, who are the important people in these networks, and it's a very different view of America than than we might automatically have, but it becomes really important for investigators of all kinds. Well, that's exactly right. So once the internet blooms, and then social media is here, and it's so much easier to have all these connections and to find them, then they really take the data in so many different ways. Some of them are pretty frightening in terms of. It impacting health insurance and mortgages and car purchasing. I mean, there are so many different things that I had not thought about till I was reading your book that they can really tell based on what people own or what they follow or who they're friends with. They can predict what they're going to do. Yeah. I talked to one of the the people at one of the companies that that Asher eventually sold his products to, which LexisNexis. And so a former executive there, he said, well, look, past is just a predicate of the future. That's, That's all this stuff is, is it's a big prediction machine. It's a way to really drill down on a person's past and get the details about their life until now. And then you kind of know what they're going to do next, at least on a on an aggregate scale. That's what insurance is, is looking at you as a as a person and trying to predict, are they a good bet? Are they going to get in a wreck? And what was chilling and I think also barely understood in these early days was that the record they started to build when Asher started collecting all this information would just stay with you. You know, public agencies purge their records, but but Asher's companies have your records going back for now almost thirty years, and that matters especially to now healthcare companies. And as you mentioned, healthcare companies are able to predict who's going to have healthier outcomes, and not in part because of your clinical condition, but also because they can see how you grew up. Did you live in a neighborhood that had a lot of air pollution? Did you have a good education? They can see your media diet now. Are you someone who gets your your news from from news sources, or are you reading just memes on Facebook? They know that, and that that might translate to: Are they going? Are you going to take your medication on time? Are you going to trust the advice of your doctor? And they they know what kind of public transit is near your current house, and if you have a car, so that can tell them if you're likely to make your your appointment. And and that's uh, that's healthcare for policing. It happens too. You know, has this? Does this person know people who have been involved in crimes? What's what's their history across neighborhoods? Are they a good bet? Yeah, it, it has a funneling effect, and it makes your past a lot more predictive of your future. Sort of by by dint of the fact that we've kept a record of the past now for thirty years. And the point you mentioned just a little bit ago, and that you also hammer home in the book, is that there isn't anything we can do about it. There's no way to go out there and get rid of this data. Not entirely, although there are ways to sort of go out and scrub your social media profile. You can't go to some of these companies and say, hey, you've got that information. Can you please get rid of me? No, that's not how it works. You have the right under various now very old laws in this country to know what some of these companies hold on you. You have a right to sort of see what information is out there and maybe try to correct it. But that's different than them not collecting it at all. You can't make yourself a ghost anymore. Exactly. Which is sort of terrifying. It is. And and I think it's different for for different groups of people too. One data point Asher's companies got early on was utilities. And that was when you hook up, when you get gas or electricity at your home or a phone connection, that uh, information gets sent to a consortium. It kind of tracks who who is paying their bills and who isn't. It's sort of like a credit reporting agency for utilities. And that information then gets sold on to these data brokers. And that came to the fore during the Trump administration when there was a major crackdown on immigration. And it turned out that as people were trying to you know, live in 
live in this country and perhaps avoid detection, that the fact that they needed running water and electricity was helping turn them into authorities because ICE was was uh, tapping into these data sources. And it yeah it was it was an interesting case in, in part because it, it yeah it showed that nobody can hide and 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 the more you're sort of embedded into the American economy as as those who are getting credit cards and driver's licenses and insurance are whether or not they have their documented immigrants or not or whether or not they're immigrants those people are showing up loud and clear in these systems and now for a quick break to take a moment and thank today's sponsor, Air Doctor. Americans spend an average of 90% of their time indoors and take approximately 20,000 breaths a day. According to the EPA, indoor air is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air, and in some cases, even up to 100 times more polluted. I struggle with allergies myself that poor air quality exacerbates, and so using my air purifier from Air Doctor really helps me manage my allergies. So what's the solution to poor air quality? Air Doctor has introduced an air purifier that has captured the attention of established media outlets such as CNN, Money, and more. Air Doctor filters out 99.99% of dangerous contaminants and allergens, such as pollen, pet dander, dust mite, mold, and even bacteria and viruses, so your lungs don't have to. All Air Doctor purifiers also feature whisper jet fans, 30% quieter than ordinary air purifiers. Want to breathe better? Head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code Thoughts from a Page. And depending on the model, you'll receive up to 39% off or up to $300 off. Exclusive to podcast customers, you will also receive a free three year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. Lock in this special offer by going to A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use promo code thoughts from a page. Air Doctor also comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus the shipping. And now back to the rest of the show. Well, what surprised you the most as you were researching and writing this book? Like what was something that you didn't expect? The thing that surprised me most was how many of these these so-called new privacy fights we're having, the Cambridge Analytica scandal in 2018, various uh, fights over election rolls, various fights over what's known as predictive policing. These are fights we've already had for the most part. We've already had big battles between civil society groups on one side and uh, companies and, and sometimes governments on the other about what data should be collected. Now, obviously, there's there's more information out there, and and there's there's more data being produced now than there was before. More on the internet, more location, but the fights are fundamentally the same. And to give one example, there was Asher's companies were involved with uh, the Bush Gore election in 2000 in Florida, and there was a major push in Florida to make sure that nobody was voting illegally, uh, and so they were trying to strip felons from the voter rolls. And so they hired Asher's company after Asher was gone from it, by the way, he'd moved on to the next one and asked them to sort of clean up the voter rolls. And they they scrubbed thousands of people. That's more than the margin of victory that Bush had over Gore. And uh, that was a fight we've seen. There have been fights over the voter rolls ongoing forever since then. Another current fight is about what's what I mentioned about predictive policing, which is the idea that you can sort of figure out who's likely to be involved in a in a shooting crime whether as victim or or trigger puller and that whole idea of predicting criminality is something that Asher also developed after after 911 when he built the what he called the matrix which was giving different scores to everybody in the country to decide who was most likely to be a terrorist yeah it was it was the fact that so many of these things had already occurred and that we'd just kind of forgotten about them and they kept rearing up and that predictive policing, I mean, if you take that farther down the road, could be quite scary. I mean, the idea that you could be arrested because you might commit a crime. I mean, obviously, that's not happening now. But I think you could take that to a conclusion that's quite chilling. Yeah. Well, that is, that is a minority report, of course. And in Los Angeles, and especially Chicago, there have been programs that take all this information about you, about people, and they do target certain people for for further follow-ups, basically, further scrutiny by the police. And so it's not necessarily going out and arresting people, but in a few of these cases, they have actually given scores to people for the likelihood that they would be involved in some sort of gang violence. And then those people have been singled out for more police visits, in some cases, social worker visits, which may be more positive, but in some cases, just they're on, the, they're on a list. And of course, police know how to work a list. And so people have had their lives turned 
turned upside down because they showed up on these predictive lists about their criminality. There's a, a case in Chicago that the uh, publication The Verge covered where someone was on Chicago's list. He hadn't been involved in any shooting crimes, but eventually he was involved. He was shot twice himself as a victim because people in the neighborhood saw the police visiting him all the time and thought he was a snitch. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So they just went out and and so then someone in the neighborhood said, well, we, we better stop this guy from talking more to the police. And so it was because he was predicted by this program to be involved in violence, it came true. It sort of encapsulates the concern here. Absolutely. Gosh. Ugh. When you really start thinking how far some of these things could go, it is truly terrifying. Well, what about the title and the cover? Like, I'm always so curious how a title comes about, and you have a long subtitle on this one, and then the cover. Well, luckily, that's not, I would say, not above my pay grade, but I can claim no no real skill at either one. I can say that the title of The Hank Show did come from my interviews, and that someone talked about how Asher so took up all the oxygen in the room and his antics were so much to watch that he was so dominating and that he was so he was so loud and so funny and so crazy sometimes that there was a, a friend who came over and said it was like it was like watching TV. It was like he would just come over to be entertained by whatever Asher was doing in the room. So that that person called it the Hank Show. And so when we were kicking around title ideas, I threw that out on a on a long list of of ones that that we could consider. But Ultimately, I think the I think St. Martin's Press should get all the all the credit for picking it from among the the rest. We struggled a bit. I'd, it was hard to capture that this was a book that wasn't just scary or depressing, but it was actually about a a very in, interesting person, and that also what that person built affects all of us. And so the the idea of the Hank Show is that kind of he built this reality, and now we're all in it. And so the the, the show is about him, but it's also created by him. And I think the cover does that very well too. Is that it? It has the uh, this sort of this person walking into a room and the light, the the Klieg lights behind him, sort of illuminating the stage. But it's it's dark. I think it's a beautiful cover. I do too. And the shadows. I mean, I think the shadows kind of have two purposes. Obviously, from the light behind him, but just the shadows from everything he created. Yeah. So I, it was a hard. It was a harder balance, and I think it's been hard to position the book. Is it a? Is it a biography? Is it an investigation of our of our data soaked world? Is it is it both? And you know, I I think it's both. But the uh, confines of of book selling don't don't always know what to do with that. That's something that I frequently talk about: how pigeonholed books have to be, and how hard it can be to market them when they straddle a couple. I would definitely not call it a biography on its own, just because I think there's so much more to it. But that's interesting. Yeah, I never thought of it as. And this is what I said to Asher's family. Is that I don't want to stand in judgment of the man himself. The point of this book is not to, you know, ultimately people don't know who he was and they should, but the reason they should is because of what he built and how it affects our lives. So it's not something that's going to stand in judgment or be a profile of this, of this man, except as a as sort of as a means to an end is that I, I don't want to judge him, but I do think it is our place to now judge his creations and what effect they have on our lives. So yeah, that was the... That was the the straddling act, always. Yes, definitely. To understand what he built and how it impacts us. And that, to me, is the most interesting part of the story. Mm -hmm. And his his own pathologies, I think. There were other people doing compiling data like this, but mostly for advertising. And if you think about what advertisers do, because they just want to blast out a bunch of ads to a bunch of people as targeted as possible and have a good quantity of them respond enough of them that, that their product gets sold. So they're trying to figure out really what do people like, what do they want to buy, what have they bought in the past. And that's pretty different than what Asher's products are. Asher is in the world of what's known as risk, risk management. And that's much more about finding what a person has hidden. And not necessarily that they're hiding it themselves, but it's really about finding these connections, something derogatory on their record, something that allows you to judge who they are, what they know, what they might do wrong. Because the people using it are insurers and police and banks. It's a narrower set of information. They don't want to know that you what you're going to eat for dinner tomorrow. They do want to know with great fidelity who your relatives are and who your who your close associates are, maybe who your neighbors are. Because in some cases they might 
if they're the police looking for a fugitive, they might want to know where you're hiding out. And so it, a lot of this stuff is because Asher himself had something to hide. And he had this, this great secret for a long time that he'd been a cocaine smuggler. And he knew how cops would want to investigate someone like him. And he knew how to build a, build a product that would work for them. And I think that's, that's ultimately one of the reasons it's worth knowing who he was. It's because his mentality is now seeped into a lot of America. Exactly. No, I agree with that. Well, before we wrap up, Mackenzie, I would love to know what you've read recently that you really enjoyed. Well, I admit that anything that's really recent that I've been reading has been some unbelievably boring reports on uh, on natural gas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I don't want to know about those. Maybe something you read a little while ago. <laughs> yeah, but I will say I've been rereading my my friend uh, Kristen Millares Young's book, Subduction. It's a a novel about it's about an anthropologist and uh, who visits a, a a whaling village uh, on the in the Pacific out here and it's just a beautiful study both of the 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 people in Nia Bay and it's about loss and it's just a and it's beautifully written and it's sharply drawn characters and and it's just it feels very different from this uh this this boring data stuff but it's also the there's some issues about yeah it's about relationships and and ultimately about justice too so that's a that's been a wonderful diversion, and I will say that as I was starting to to work on on my book on the Hank Show, I was reading things like uh, you know the making of the atomic bomb and uh, by Richard Rhodes and or the the Big Short by Michael Lewis. Let's see, IBM and the Holocaust, another book. All of these being books about sort of the the prehistory of this this bad moment in time and about something something bad is going to happen and every reader who picks up this book knows what that is you know in the, in the big short is the financial crisis and the making of the atomic bomb well it's right there in the title and and those were helpful as i thought about this book because i really wanted people to understand how do we get to now you know with, uh, not to be dramatic about our moment with with data and big data because i don't think it's quite the atomic bomb but it is also it's been a slow road to something that is very powerful and is affecting all of our lives and it, it's it changed the world. So those were my guides. Well, much like the atomic bomb, I mean, these things start out for one thing and they end up being used for another. And I think there's definitely that analogy for the beginning of the things that were created that then were used for the atomic bomb. Also, the things that were created in this book and then are used as they are now. That's right. And and in all these cases, there have always been a few people who noticed what was going on, either because they were the ones who were building it and they understood it better than everyone else. Or because they were skeptics from the beginning, outside skeptics, and that's that was when you asked before about what surprised me is it was it was that that there were there were always people who saw this coming, and I wish the rest of us had had seen those people and listened to them. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Mackenzie. I truly appreciate it. I thought your book was fascinating, and I'm glad we got to talk more about it. Likewise, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts From a Page. If you enjoy this show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts From a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. 
Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon.